plucked from a small impoverished town in Brazil, Pele transformed the National World Cup team. Before his 1958 debut, black players were considered inferior, so they sometimes rubbed their faces with rice paper to look more white. When Pele secured the cup from Sweden, he destroyed the black player myth forever. His influence on soccer didn't stop there. He changed the way the game was played. This man's record of 1,282 goals, including 130 hat-tricks, is unequaled. But it was at the World Cup of 1970 that he convinced many, once and for all, that he was the greatest soccer player of all time. To me, Pelé was the most complete player in as much that I don't think he had a single weakness. He was kind of Michael Owen, Ruud van Nistelrooy, Diego Maradona, Johan Cruyff, all the, all the great footballers you can think of, rolled into one. We can talk about Muhammad Ali being the global sportsman, but he's not as much a global sportsman as Pelé was. And he's going to get a call. Oh, what? Uh, what idiot! He was a magical footballer, gifted footballer, right foot, left foot, didn't really matter that much to him, you know. Um, he was good in the air, he was brave, but he had this, he had this ability and this pace to, to get, it, get him into positions where he could score dramatic goals. This is one of the most famous moments in World Cup history. And it's Pelé! He's got it! Pelé has scored! Indeed, the shirt he's wearing sold recently for a record 158,000 pounds. By scoring in the final of 1970, he earned himself the unique honor as the only player with three World Cup championships. But he had vowed not to be there the manager had dropped him. He'd been bankrupt, his marriage was on the rocks, and he was a black man dealing with racism. So just who is Edson Arantes de Nascimento, also known as Pele? Brazil is a rich country full of poor people. The countryside and hills are dotted with small towns brimful of families just getting by. In one such town, in October 1940, Edson Arantes de Nascimento, later nicknamed Pele, was born. His father was a footballer, rather unlucky footballer, called Dogginho. Within five minutes of him making his debut, he'd, uh, he'd suffered a really serious injury. and uh, He returned home fairly soon afterwards and never played in the big leagues ever again. They had a really difficult life. They were very poor, but very rich in everything you know, else. It was just poor economically, but very wealthy in, in, in love and in, in, in nurturing and in, in direction. You know, he was given a very uh, defined direction from his parents, and I think that, that prepared him to be who he was. The first Pelé was actually quite naughty. A little boy that shone shoes to make some money, who delivered laundry that his mother, a washerwoman, had been paid to wash. Often he'd lead the clothes to one side of the road while he played football. The clothes, of course, got dirty and his mother would have to wash them all over again. We played with balls of many different kinds. One of them was a ball made of socks. We'd fill the socks with strips of cloth and newspaper. And we knew how to sew to make it as round as possible. The young Edson picked up a new name, a name with no meaning, Pele. The boy called me Pele in the street. I don't know if I made some mistake or if it was a joke. I fight with the boy. I don't like. I said, no, my name is Edson. Then whole school, the girls start to call Pelé, Pelé, to tease me. And then I get the nickname Pelé, but I, nobody knows why. <laughs> Pelé would get the ball and dribble past one, two, three, and would score goal after goal. The older boys could only get the ball away from him by giving him a good whack. By the age of eight, people were coming just to watch him play. Pele was too poor to buy equipment, 
Only when he was 11 and an amateur team had picked him up did he get his first shoes, then a uniform. Then, at age 15, he left home to join a professional league team, Santos. Within a season, the teenager had become Santos' top scorer. His reputation spread so quickly that in July 1957, he was picked for the national team. And in June 1958, the skinny 17-year-old was off to Sweden, hoping to help Brazil win its first World Cup. The World Cup, you know, playing a tournament like the World Cup, where the best players in the world are congregated to find out who is the best, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it was just magical. But because of his color, Pele faced the possibility that he might not get his chance to play with the best. In the early days, sides were all, were all white, famously um, the Fluminense club in, uh, in Rio um, uh, used to uh, play black players and, and dust their faces with rice powder so that, uh, so that they, they were passed off as, uh, as, as white people. <laughs> The manager was reluctant to play more than one black player, but a poor start to the tournament forced his hand. The team themselves demanded changes, and here was Pele, lining up for the third game against the mighty Soviet Union. Pele was 17 at the time, and looked 12, and you think the boy should be in school. Anyone who had thought Pele would be in awe of the Soviet Union was mistaken. He helped Brazil to an easy 2-0 victory. Pele had arrived. My vision of 1958 was of this very wispy kid who looked as if he shouldn't really been there. He looked as if he should have been a ball boy rather than a player. In the next game, Brazil played Wales. And the ball boy scored the only goal. Well, he was a shy little boy, really but until he got the ball. He was magic. He looked a little boy amongst men, if you, you know, if you played against him and when you saw him, he was a little boy, but a tremendously skillful little boy. Against France, in the semi-final, Pele scored a hat-trick. What a of this boy is at 17. The final was the great test. Brazil, determined to win its first world championship, lined up against the hosts, Sweden. The pressure on the 17-year-old Pele was extraordinary. He did not disappoint. I mean, abiding memories is, is, is of the, the thing that everybody remembers, I think, that, that goal that, uh, which, which showed his, his awareness, his uh, ability to, to make things stop in the penalty box. There he is with all the, the brashness and the arrogance. If you like, I can do anything, and he could. <laughs> Into Pele. From that moment, the myth of the black player as unsuitable to play was dead. From then on, any restrictions in the national team were effectively ended. When you're a winner, colour disappears. Pele returned home a hero. Interest from Italian clubs was rebuffed the government declared him a non-exportable national treasure. Not that his club Santos would have sold the player scoring 60 or 70 goals a season. Oh, 
Pelé won 60 titles. He helped Santos to win world titles, South American titles. There was no way Santos were going to sell their greatest asset. A professional athlete lives his life on the road. Especially at that time, Santos would do exhibition games all around the world. So he would, many times, would be gone for three or four months at a time. Uh, you know, all throughout Africa, throughout Europe. Santos, when they first toured, were paid $5,500 a game. $5,500. That soon went up to $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. And Pelé would take his cut of 10%, 15%, 20%. From 1961, 62, 63, there were fantastic tours. Pelé arrived to play against one team in Switzerland, and Santos won by eight. Pelé scored a hat-trick. At the end of the game, the fans invaded the pitch, wanting to carry him on their shoulders. But there were a lot of black players on the team, which confused them. At one moment, they realized they were carrying a player called Brandao, and someone shouted, this isn't Pelé! So they threw him back on the ground. Once we were playing in Germany, and as usual, Pelé had to take part in the game, otherwise the opposition wouldn't pay us the fee. Unfortunately, Pelé was injured, but he had to play. The public had all come to see the king. So what did our trainer Lula do? Well, Lula was a bit sharp and decided to pull a fast one and gave the famous number 10 shirt to Dorval. Now, Dorval was also a black man, a good player, but no Pelé. The public soon spotted it, and as a result, we suffered 90 minutes of non-stop booing and whistling, the whole stadium booing, booing. The pressure of constant touring and 70 or 80 games a season took its toll. I think the game was, was much more brutish when, when, when Pelé played, certainly when he started. Um, there were no red cards, no yellow cards. The sendings off were, were very, very rare. If Pelé was a player today, instead of the 1,100 or 1,200 goals he scored, he would score 2,500 or 3,000. Because today, players are much better protected and fitter. Chile, 1962. Injury forced Pele to sit out most of Brazil's successful defense of the World Cup. The disappointment he felt only fueled his determination not to end up like his father, out of the game. In his private life, the affable 22-year-old had always considered himself by his real name, Edson. On the field, he became Pele, and Pele was willing to fight back. Muita gente pergunta, uh, Many people ask, who did you spend most time with, Edson or Pelé? For me, I spent most of my time with Edson. You know, for me, in the bedrooms, during meals, it was Edson, no doubt about it. Pelé, for me, only existed on the pitch. Now, this person, from the moment he arrived at the dressing rooms, he would lie down on the massage table, put a towel over his eyes, already semi-dressed for the game. He would put this cloth over his eyes and rest for 20, 25 minutes. He would completely switch off. The impression you had was that he was becoming another personality entirely. I've seen him when he's been very naughty on the field. You know, I mean, I have. I've seen him when he actually headed somebody once in a, in a match in South America I was watching. And um, it just, you don't like to see great players do that. To be honest, you can understand any frustration that a great player like him would have because everybody was trying to put him out of the game because they couldn't do it fairly. He was just too good. The only way you could stop Pele when he was playing football was by hitting him. You hit him once, well, okay. But Pele wasn't stupid. He knew when you were trying to deliberately break something and when it was an accident. When you were hitting him to break something, he would say, okay, but if you do that again...
Going across to Shadow You Know Who. May 30th, 1964. World Cup hopefuls, England, takes on the World Cup holders, Brazil, in Rio. When Pele stayed clear of injury, he could still prove he was the best player in the world. Well, he's still got it. This man is incredible. I can remember playing against him in 1964, which was the first time that I'd come in contact with him. And, uh, you know, we were playing in Rio de Janeiro, and I think the score was about 1-1 after about 60 minutes. And we, uh, in the England team, felt we had a great chance of getting a result there. But after about 10 minutes of pure Pelly magic, I think we found ourselves four or five goals behind. And, uh, I mean, his showing that night was just absolutely unbelievable. And now it's... We got soused that day, <laughs> for a better word, <laughs> pickled. Yes, and the way he streaks again, his belly's got Baba there with him on his left. And there's Baba, but on the seat. I remember being against him in the middle of the field, and, and I had him in front of me with all the defence behind me, and I said, OK, you know, if, you, if you're such a great player, Pelle, you know, like, let's, let's see it, you know. And, and within a minute, he'd sent me on a dummy, and he'd gone down the right-hand side, and he, and he scored. Now, what's he going to do? He's got the third! Oh, beautiful goal! Pelle was the highest earning sportsman in the world. He was earning sums of money that really were unheard of, uh, not just in Brazil, but, but around the world. Uh, he, had to, he had to put in place a, 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 an organisation around him to, to manage his career, to, to look after his assets. He, he was acquiring business interests, he was buying property. Um, it was inevitable, in a way, that uh, he was going to fall foul here because he, he just didn't have the... He didn't have the intelligence, perhaps. He, he certainly didn't have the experience um, to, to pick the right people. Pele entrusted his business affairs involving millions of dollars to a financial advisor called Pepe Gordo. But the investments crashed. The world's highest earning sportsman was bankrupted. It was left to Santos to bail Pele out forcing him to sign a contract in which he agreed to play two seasons at a diminished rate and a third season for free. The only safety Pele felt was on the soccer field. And in July 1966, it brought the welcome escape of the World Cup in England. He'd missed most of the 62 World Cup in Chile after an early injury. So I think people were looking for Pele to make up for lost time. Brazil with the team everybody fancied in 66. Pele boasted they'd win it for a third time in a row. The European teams that Pele faced had other ideas. In the third game against Portugal, he was hunted down. Now the referee waves play. Now Pele upended. Off at the knees, brought right down. Had that been in this particular period of, of time, the half of Portuguese side would have been off the pitch. Is it, a penalty? it became a war, and the first casualty was Pele. Okay. Well, I thought twice actually, the referee let it go the first time. Really was heavily brought down again there the second time, quite unnecessarily so too. Defeated three to one by Portugal, the Brazil team was out and they flew home. Pele vowed he would never play in a World Cup match again. Back in Brazil, Pele returned to the wife, Rosemary, he had married shortly before the World Cup. The press had shocked Pele by criticizing his choice of a white woman. In response, he made the wedding as low-key as possible. But privacy was simply out of the question. Ela não soube conviver. She didn't know how to deal with his fame. Pelé was always surrounded by enormous attention, both male and female. It wasn't easy for a woman. And she was a woman from Santos, a, a humble family. And in an instant, became the queen, because she was married to the king of football. As well as their own daughter, Pele fathered at least two illegitimate children, and the marriage soon would be in trouble. 
Rosemary was later to claim that in the four years leading up to 1970, he was at home for only two months. One of the key demands on Pele's time came from those who ran the country, the generals. Brazil was a military dictatorship, and it knew the value of its sporting hero. They were acutely aware of the importance of football to this nation. It's modern bread and circuses. The world's religion, if we take it in terms of followers, is football. It isn't Islam, it isn't the Roman Catholic faith. It is football. If you can tap into that as a politician, you have control. And if you can do that by, as they did in the 60s, building more stadia in Brazil than they did hospitals and schools by a ratio of four or five to one, then that's the way to spend the money. The best way to make the populace forget that they didn't have a job, that they didn't have adequate housing or health or education, that their lives were wretched, was to give them a football team that could win the highest trophies in the world. In 1968, the dictatorship tilted even further to the right. A new hardline president was installed, President Emilio Medici. I've interviewed people who were tortured by the junta because they believed that they were helping the guerrillas. I've interviewed people who described to me how they were manacled in a chair uh, and were obliged to watch while their wives were raped, while their underage children were raped to get information from them. When Pele scored his 1,000th goal in November of 1969, President Medici made sure he shared the moment, presenting Pele with a ball of gold. What the regime wanted more than anything else was that Pele and the national team win the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. Enormous pressure had been put on Pele to take back his vow never to play in a World Cup again, and the dictatorship was hard to say no to. But by the start of the government-sponsored preparations, Pele faced the alarming fact of being dropped by the manager, João Saldana. Depois de 66, o Pelé passou a jogar. After 66, Pelé began to play less, get injured more, and he began to decline. He'd been putting on weight because there was so much fame, too many parties, cocktails. He got chubby, and this got in the way of football. Saldana, the manager, went public. Pele was getting old, big-headed, even short-sighted. President Medici sacked Saldana. The new manager, Zagallo, promptly assured Pele of his place. The Brazilian public, however, was less easily persuaded. They too thought Pele was in decline and that the national team stood little chance in Mexico. Pele was determined to prove them all wrong. Pele sat down with the players and he said, this is my last World Cup. I cannot take it anymore. It's too much pressure on my shoulders. Everybody would confirm that to you. He himself said, but not in those words. He said, I want to win this World Cup. <laughs> Pelé had this thing about singing. He saw himself as a bit of a singer. Thank God that wasn't his job. In Mexico, expectations were huge. Posters went up. Today, we're not working. We're off to see Pele. When the, I played the first World Cup, I just was one more player there. I didn't have a responsibility. When they played in Mexico, the last World Cup, I already was a Pelé. Everybody respected for me. All the Brazilian people, the government, they started to press me. He used to say, hey kid, 
And I'm not joking, it was a kid who used to call me. Look, we're not messing around here. We're going to win this cup. He'd go on and on saying, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to be champions of the world. You know that kind of thing. He said, you don't know what it's like to lose. It was horrible in 66, and it's not happening again. We're going to win. The atmosphere really was marvelous, so much so that once the cup started, we just exploded into it. Toto Aldo, just Pele. Oh, he left it well, but now. Well, that's what Brazilian football's all about. Rivalino. Oh! If you look at Rivellino's left foot, it was magical. Oh, yes! And hit the post! Gerson's left foot was absolutely magical. Tostel was a wonderful runner of the ball, you know, and, and taking people on. But now, what is oh, no. And Gesino could catch pigeons. That left. I expect to see the first now that Gesino and Victor. I mean, if Pelle hadn't been in this side, They'd have still been a very, very good side. But if you were looking for the, the final piece in the jigsaw to really make it a wonderful masterpiece, it was him. He was better than a great player. He's the greatest player I've ever seen. Oh, yes, Pelé! Pelé promised we would win the World Cup. He was going to lead us to victory. Absolutely, he was our commander. Having beaten Czechoslovakia 4-1, Brazil then faced the team many thought were favorites, England. It became one of the greatest games in World Cup history. We were the only side that they feared, Brazil. When Alf Ramsey came up to me uh, 20 minutes before the game, he said, look, he said, we should really play tennis side. He said, if you can stop him playing, you know, if we lose you and they lose him, then we would fancy ourselves far more. But if he now starts to dictate the game, if we could stop him playing, we'd have a better chance. And that was my job to mark him. We, we had a couple of clashes. There was no doubt about that, you know. You know, if he went for a P, I went with him. But as soon as they got the ball, I had to woof. I was like, you know, a, a butterfly on heat. I had to be there and, and right next to him, you know, uh, and give nothing away at all. goes down as one of the great games but it was a it was a very thoughtful game as well um, it was a case of if you made mistakes you know that you, you would get punished and it was a psychological game and they were very patient they were patient and at the end of the day they got the only goal in the game the game was nil nil heading towards the final whistle an extremely balanced game but on the touchline, I saw one of our attackers, Roberto, getting ready to come on, to substitute me. I felt that that was the moment I needed to do something special. Well, the only time I wasn't close to him uh, was when Tostel made the run and beat a couple of players, did me, did Moro, and they crossed the ball, and there was Pelle just knocking it on for Jezina to knock it in the back of the net. that they were going to gain in momentum and confidence. And they can almost see them sort of breathing in and saying, right, here we are, we're going. And I mean, that, that, that World Cup, it was almost as if it was, they were fated to win it, really. When we left for Mexico, the supporters really didn't believe we could win. We players, however, we knew that we'd come back with the cup. This was it, the final, Brazil versus Italy. 
both teams had won the Jules Rimet trophy twice. The winner for a third time would be allowed to keep it. Pele was determined that the trophy's permanent home would not be Rome, but Rio. Galvinho, Carlos Alberto, lovely bit of overlapping. And Pele just inches wide and almost took his own head off with the upright. He was getting on a bit. But he manufactured these things in his mind. You know, it, it, it's worth three yards to you. A good footballing brain. He is never in the position he received the ball. He arrives. And that means he's probably left his marker for dead. Oh, what a canny stuff. Rivellino. And it's Pelé. He's got it. Pelé has scored. And that is Brazil's 100th goal in the World Cup. And that was Pelé's 12th in the World Cup. And the most important, paving the way to becoming the one and only soccer player to have played on three World Cup champions. Pelé would score marvellous, audacious goals of great individual skill, but, 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 but some of his best moments were the goals he laid on for others. Pelé just stopped the ball, looked up, he knew I'd be running along the right. He did this beautifully weighted pass, couldn't have been better. It was fantastic. All I had to do was hit it. Na passada certa e o chute saiu inclusive bastante forte, né? Pelé, a Carlo Alberto on the right, and it's four. Oh, that was sheer delightful football. E aquilo coroou com êxito a nossa campanha e para mim particularmente. And that crowned our victory. For me in particular, it was an indescribable moment. I could hardly breathe when we were celebrating the goal because the joy of the goal was combined with the knowledge that it had absolutely secured us victory. O que naquele momento sacramentava a nossa vitória. Brazil had beaten Italy four to one. They were World Cup champions for the third time. It was an absolute riot, quite unbelievable. But it was everything to win the World Cup. You really can't explain it. The significance, it just meant everything. We were just on top of the world. When we got back to the changing room, everyone was drinking champagne and tequila and crying, screaming and laughing. He swallowed what they did to him, which I thought was a disgrace. What they did to him before the World Cup was terrible. To say he was blind, that he couldn't play anymore, that he was finished in football, but he swallowed it and prepared his response. Because as an athlete, you don't give your answer off the pitch. He kept it to himself and went on the pitch and showed them who Pelly really was. And then he did something I will never forget. Look what happens when I think about it. I still get goosebumps. The game finished. He came in the dressing room and shouted three times, I'm not dead, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. I've come to the conclusion that after having won the World Cup three times, it really is the moment for me to quit. Anyway, I'm 30 years old, and I'm not sure I'd make it to the next World Cup in Germany. Pelé told me he was facing something that would be very difficult for a Brazilian superstar to face, and that's what he was. The people running his country were despicable that uh, the quality of life for many of the, the people in his country, particularly of his colour, was why he said, enough's enough. Even President Medici could not prevent Pele from retiring from the national team in July 1971. He claims the government threatened to have a close look at his tax affairs if he didn't play in the next World Cup, but he refused to change his mind, and indeed he also retired from Santos in October 1974. Business and politics were to be his arenas from now on. 
In booming cities like Sao Paulo, big business is aware of soccer potential in the image business. And the superstars can earn more from commercials than they'll ever earn in the field. Pele's commercial interests include public relations for a bank, commercials for an oil company, and interest in a factory. Once again, however, Pele went bankrupt. By 1974, he got into trouble with a uh, rubber plantation interest that he'd invested very heavily in. Uh, typically, Pele had signed some pieces of paper which apparently made him personally liable for the debts uh, of the company. The company had gone into trouble, its creditors were after their money, and it seemed that um, Pele had to cough up something like $2 million uh, to sort the situation out. Despite claiming he'd retired for good, he now returned to clear these debts. He signed for the New York Cosmos for $6 million. Pele played for two years, creating the first U.S. soccer boom. Then, on October 1st, 1977, he finally did retire from professional soccer. But if his wife Rosemary and family thought he'd be spending more time at home, they were sorely mistaken. He's always someone that was very patient, very lovable, but my main memory of my father was he was always at work. And uh, my mother's like a heroine to me, you know, she is like a mother and a father to us always. She would always go to the father-son, you know, reunions and, and sporting events and it was something that at first even embarrassed me a little bit and then as I grew older it just made me so much more proud of my mother and, and you know proud of her being there with me and her being the only mother amongst all the fathers. Ele estava em Buenos Aires, aliás ele estava em Mar del Plata, contratado... He was in Argentina commentating for Venezuelan TV on the 1978 World Cup. I was with him when he got the phone call telling him that his wife had just gone into labor and they had an argument because just before he left the US his wife had told him you'd better get back for this birth or I'm getting a divorce and he was told the baby had been born he left for home but that was it really pretty soon afterwards they split up in the years that followed, Pele faced a new problem. What to do in retirement? What I did with my life, uh, put my heart and my work, and uh, you trust me. And I hope so you trust me and my new job. Any job what I can do. The big thing about Pele, he, he sort of achieved ambassadorial status. Once he'd, once he'd gone to America, once he'd played for the New York Cosmos, once, once he'd you know, become a product as such, that was when the, the world football statesman began to emerge. For purely commercial reasons, of course. Cartão Pelé Unibanco Mastercard. Solicite o seu e ajude a Fundação Abril. You know, he's no fool. He still knew he was a viable commercial product. Pele began a sports marketing company. Its primary asset, him, promoting soccer, credit cards, health insurance, soft drinks, banks, oil, electronics, and phone companies, and most recently, Viagra. Perhaps stung by criticism that he hadn't spoken out against the dictatorship, Pele now decided to enter politics. In 1995, he got his chance. Brazil's president made him minister of sport. Well, it's more of a burden than a post. It's something that takes a lot of time. It's a very visible position. It's an area that he's not used to, and he did well. Not everyone thought so. His efforts to make the sale of soccer rights more open were seen to be as much about him and his business interests as about soccer in general. Como ministro, ele fez uma lei. As a minister, he created a law which, though it had some good points, certainly favoured sports marketing companies, one of which he owned. In other areas too, Pele has left himself open to criticism. An illegitimate daughter from the 1960s of whom Pele claimed ignorance proved him the father with blood tests. And recently, a second illegitimate child has turned up. In June 1994, Pele married again to an evangelical singer called Assyria, but the world travels continued. 
Pele, the corporate icon, a man who charges $50,000 an interview, now earns in excess of $20 million a year. But Pele finds it hard to avoid controversy. Recently, he shut down his sports marketing company, he and his ex-business partner accusing one another of stealing millions of dollars. When he was young, fine. He was tricked by a businessman who took care of his things. But with the passing of time, a man of 60, 61 years old, who's lived so much like he has, who's traveled the whole world, it's a bit difficult to accept. I'm not one to give him advice, but I guess I reckon he should choose his friends more carefully. The Pelé that I knew still exists. What's changed is Edson. To me, he no longer has that jaw that he had before. I saw this a little while ago, when the old team, though not Pelé, he was too busy, were filmed here in this very stadium at Santos, singing our old team song. It was our anthem, which we used to sing at all our games. He must really miss his old mates because I know that when he heard this recording, he cried a great deal. É criolo de bana, é criolo chutando, é criolo comemorando. Esse ano não, esse ano não vai ter colher de chá. Eu não conheço muito o Edson. Eu conheço do que se apresenta. I don't really know the man called Edson. I know what I see and hear in the press or on the news. And sometimes there are bad things reported which sadden me and no doubt sadden Edson too. I'm sure he's unhappy about what's been going on. It's a real shame and one considers what a great athlete he was. I know the player Pelly more than the man Edson, and the player was certainly the best, the best player I've seen in my entire life. November 19th is Pele Day in Santos. That is a fitting tribute to the man the International Olympic Committee named Athlete of the Century in 1999. The runners-up are also distinguished black athletes, Americans Muhammad Ali, Carl Lewis, and Michael Jordan. Thank you for saluting black culture with us. For Bio Channel, I'm Kelly Dedman. And it's Pelé. He's got it. Pelé has scored. Many of the influential African Americans profiled here tonight did more than just cross the color line. They excelled in their fields and brought inspiration to people everywhere. Thanks for joining us for this celebration of black culture on Bio Channel.